Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. In this episode of Blazor Train, I'm going to create a Guess the Word game. It'll be a standalone Blazor WebAssembly app, and I'll share the GitHub repo with you at blazortrain.com. So, one night last week, I couldn't sleep. Got up in the middle of the night and pretty much wrote the whole thing in a few hours. Yeah, I had to fix up a couple bugs, but it was mostly there. And I figured the Blazor Train audience might like to take a break from building business software and have a little fun. In this game, the computer picks a random five letter word from a dictionary, and the player gets six chances to guess the word. The player starts off with no clues whatsoever. The rules are that one, the word has to be in the dictionary in order to qualify for a guess, and two, the word has to be exactly five letters. The computer evaluates the guessed word and colors the letters according to their accuracy. Correct letters in the correct position turn blue. Correct letters in an incorrect position turn orange. Incorrect letters turn gray. The goal is to not only guess the word, but to do so in the fewest number of guesses. Hey, we're building a word game from scratch with C Sharp, Blazor, and Visual Studio. And that's coming up right now, right here on Blazor Train! All right, hang on to your hats because Word Mania is about to begin. I have a Blazor WebAssembly application that's brand new. It's a standalone application. Uh, it's not a hosted application, and it's called Word Mania. So before I start doing stuff here, let's get rid of the stuff that's in the default template that we're not going to use. So I'm going to go to Pages. I'm going to delete Counter and Fetch Data. Gonna go to shared, gonna take out nav menu and survey prompt. And while we're at it, we're gonna replace main layout with something a little more simple. Now here's what I need to do. I need to draw a grid in the top half of the screen that's five columns and six rows. I really have to use pixels in my CSS. I can't use percentages because you can't really get a percent of the height. I want an exact pixel number. So what I need to do is get the screen's width, and from that, I can figure out the width of the grid and divide it by five to get the width of the cell, and then I'll just make the height of the cell the same as the width of the cell. So in order to do that, I need a little JavaScript. And for that, we're going to webroot index HTML. So here's my function, and this is how you set up a function in JavaScript that you can call from C Sharp, by the way. I know I've covered that, but here you go. It's window dot, and then whatever you want to call it, equals your parameters in parentheses, and then a lambda, and then your code with one of these semicolons at the bottom. So what this return is doing is saying, hey, I want to return an object that has a width property, set it to the inner width of the window, and a height property, set it to the inner height of the window. And we can call this from C-sharp, and then we can get the width and height in pixels of the screen. Now, just so I don't have crazy long style strings, which I'm probably gonna have anyway, uh, I'm gonna add a couple of CSS classes in app.css, which is also in the web root CSS folder. And this is the default CSS file that Blazor sets up for you. So it's a good place to put your own stuff. So here we have a center class. And this is good because I can use this to center any div horizontally. Then I have a grid class. And this is going to be for the table itself. The only thing we've added here is a padding of 20 pixels and a width of 100%. So we want to take up 100% of the screen with the grid. Next we have grid cell, so this is the cell inside the table. So yes, I'm gonna use HTML tables. A TR is a row, a TD is a cell. So the grid cell is gonna have the centering stuff as well. Extra, extra large font, bold font, five pixels of padding, and a border around it. That's one pixel solid and black. All right, let's take over index as we are wont to do. Now it should be pretty obvious what I'm doing here. I have a div of class grid, 
So that's going to take up 100%, right? And then I have the table, and I'm setting the width dynamically. This isn't something that I can pre-program because the width is based on the width of the screen, which we're going to calculate. So you can see the at width there. It's expecting a field width, which we haven't defined yet, but we will. So then I'm going to go in a loop for six rows, and I'm going to do a TR six times. And then in each row, I'm going to loop through five times for the columns. And I'm going to do five TDs, or table cells, really is what they are. And in each cell, I've got a div with a class grid cell. And I'm going to add the width and height dynamically. And these are going to be pixel based, based on our screen as well. So let's do a code behind index razor CS where we can get the width and height of the screen and then set these values. All right, let's start down here with the class window dimension. So this is the object, if you will, that's going to be returned from JavaScript. And I've just defined a width and height property, int. OK. So here's where the magic happens, on after render async. So this happens in a Blazor page after every render. Now the first time it renders, in other words, when you load it up for the first time, this Boolean right here, first render, is going to be true. So all I have to do to initialize and call JavaScript once is check that value. And on that condition, that's when I make my call to JavaScript. Now, why don't I do that in on initialized async or on parameter set? Well, the reason is pretty simple. JavaScript doesn't exist until you render. So this, in general, is a really good pattern to call any initial JavaScript in a Blazor application. And we're going to call uh, invoke async, returning a window dimension, get window dimension. And that's our object right there. Now I'm going to shave off 20% of the width. And that's going to be the width of our grid. Now I need to make the width string because it's got to have the px after it in order to be used in that style statement. And now I'm going to calculate the cell width to be this grid width divided by 5. So then we also add px to that. And then I'm calling invoke state is changed because I want it to refresh again. So there's my width and cell width right there. They're protected strings. That means my index page can see them. My markup can see them. Let's double check. Yep, no squiggles. All right, let's run it and see if we can get a grid. Now as this comes up, I'm going to narrow it so the layout more resembles a phone because I want this to be a mobile web app, right? This is a phone game. It's not really a, you know, a desktop game. So we're going to make it as if uh, it's made for the phone. Well, anyway, there's our grid. It's just got X's in it because that's all we told it to do. And, uh, you know, this is where I usually start. I want to start with the UI elements and make sure they look good before I start adding code. What's the next step? Well, this is a word guessing game. So we need words. Where am I going to get a bunch of five-letter words? Well, it turns out I have a source. And here it is, the Stanford Graph Base. And this is a book by Donald Newth. And in this book, he includes this public domain SGB words text, which contains 5,757 five-letter words of English. And he says the five, seven, five, seven, five letter words of English, implying that this is a complete set. Now, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, there are some words in here I've never heard of before. So I think using these words will make the game more challenging than other versions of this game, which you might have seen. And let's just take a look at it, shall we? Yeah, that's a whole bunch of words. Now, I've already downloaded it and changed the name to words.txt. Here it is on my desktop. And I'm just going to copy that into my web root. And also, I'm going to change this property, copy to output directory, to 
copy if newer. All right, now let's change our code to actually load up those words and then pick one at random. So I've added a couple of fields, all words, which is a string array, which can be null, and current word, which is a string. And this will be the word that we select at random. Now on initialized async, I have acknowledged the source of my words.txt. There it is. Don't know if I need to do that, but I think it's polite. I'm going to load that file into a string, and this is how we do it in WebAssembly. And then I'm going to split that up into an array, all words. Now I'm calling a method that I created called reset game, which gets the random word. Now, why did I have to do this? Well, because the player might want to play again. And when they play again, I need a way to reset all the variables, get a new random word, all that stuff. Now there are no real variables that I need to reinitialize yet, but this is where they're going to go. So let's talk about get random word. I'm using random number generator from system security cryptography to get a random number between zero and the last index of all words. And this is a really easy, simple way to get a random number. That's about as random as you can get. So that returns the number or the index in the array. And then I just return all words at that index. So how are we going to show that we have a word? How about this? So we've got a header and we're using the center class. So it'll go in the middle and we're showing current word. Let's try it. There you go. All right. So we have a word and I guess if I refresh this, I'll press F5. We're going to get another word. So now we've got a grid. We've got a word to guess. Now we need a keyboard. We need a little keyboard down here where we can type in the word that we want to guess, right? Because that's how this works. You guess a word and then using color, the app is going to tell you which ones you got right, which ones you got wrong. And if you got a letter correct, but it's in the wrong place. So I went looking for an HTML CSS keyboard and I found one. Now this is done by Gregory Shire. It's very nice looking. I, I only want to use a subset of this, but let's see what the license says about how I can use it. This is what he says. You have a copyright statement and permission is hereby granted free of charge to any person obtaining a copy of this software and associated documentation files to deal in the software without restriction including, without limitation, the rights to use, copy, modify, merge, publish, distribute, sublicense, and or sell copies of the software, and to permit persons to whom the software is furnished to do so, subject to the following conditions. The above copyright notice and this permission notice shall be included in all copies or substantial portions of the software. And then it goes on with a boilerplate uh, disclaimer, the software is provided as is without warranty of any kind, yada, yada, yada. So in other words, you can use it at your own risk. And as long as you have the, the statement and the license and the copyright, and basically this text, and you put that in the code, you're free to do with it what you want. Thank you, Gregory. I think I will. Now at the site, you've got the HTML and we got the CSS and you've got JavaScript to respond to the key presses and whatnot. I'm not going to use the JavaScript. I'm just going to use a stripped down version of the CSS and a stripped down version of the HTML. Now let's start with the CSS. So I've got his copyright notice in there. I've got the boilerplate disclaimer, and we've got classes for keyboard, keyboard row, and key letter. Basically, this is the stripped down version of the keyboard with just classes that I'm going to use. All right, now let's go add the HTML. I've got the copyright disclaimer, and now I've got a div with the keyboard class, and I've got three rows, keyboard row, and then each of these is a key letter. So let's just take a look at this a little closer. All I've got is the width that I'm going to determine 
programmatically, just as I did with the grid, and the letter itself. So we've got the top row, the middle row, and the bottom row. And at the bottom row, I've got a delete key. And the only thing I've done here is I've changed the background color to red, and I'm using the less than. Now I also have a button to submit, submit the word. And the only styling I've got here is a little padding on the div itself, and then the button, I've set the height to the same height as the keys. All right, let's now update the code to support this. And you can see that I've taken the using statements out. I'm gonna go put those back in program, but I'm gonna make them global. I'm trying to get used to setting things up like this, using global using statements, instead of scattering using statements all over my code. Now I've added this, key width. And let's calculate that. So just like I determined the width of the grid by shaving off 20%, I'm going to determine the width of the entire keyboard by shaving off 10%. So it's going to be a little bit wider than the grid. Obviously, I want this thing to be expanded as far as it can without looking too crappy. So in key width, I've set that to the entire keyboard width divided by 11 and I added the PX to it. And I really haven't done anything else, that's it. So all we're doing is displaying the keyboard with the right size. Let's give it a run. There we go. And the keys have that nice little effect of being pressed, I like that. So now I've got a keyboard, I've got a grid, I can use this to submit the letters, now we can move on. Let's do something to react when the player clicks on one of those keys. So we're gonna set up on click handlers for each one of these keys. So let me tell you how I did this here. Notice that I have single quotes around the entire expression for on click. That's because I needed to call a method to handle the key press, passing in an explicit value in quotes. And if you use a double quote here and a double quote there, and double quotes in here, it's not gonna work. The only way I figured out I could do this is using single quotes, which is in the realm of the DOM in the browser, right? Single quotes around the entire expression, and then I can call key press with double quotes. It's just one of those quirks, and you know, I'm glad that we have the option of doing both. Okay, now we also have this key color. Key color is going to be determined dynamically because the color of the key is dependent on the state of the key. All right, did we already guess this letter? Is the letter incorrect? Is it correct? Is it the right letter but in the wrong place? So the state of the guess, or the letter, determines the color of the key. So let's add these two methods right now, key press and key color. Starting with key press. So key press passes the letters, you know. Now I have three conditions. The letter could be DEL, I press the delete key, could be enter, or it could be just a letter. Now I've also introduced this variable dead letters. Dead letters is a string that's gonna contain all the letters that I've guessed. And I'm gonna use it properly in the game logic. Um, but right now I'm just using it to show a little bit of UI difference, basically when we click on a letter. We're not into game logic just yet. So whenever I click on a letter, I'm gonna add it to dead letters. And then you can see if I click enter, I'm gonna clear dead letters. And then if I press delete, I'm going to remove the last letter, right? And so how is that gonna to translate to UI? Well, look at key color. And this should be letter. Let's just change that because that's really what it is. So if the letter that I'm getting the color for is not in my dead letter string, in other words, index of returns minus one, then I wanna return gray. So that's the default color for the key. Otherwise, I wanna return black. So as I'm pressing keys, those keys will turn black. Let's try it. So they're gray, and I start typing, and they turn black. 
If I press delete, the last key that I pressed gets removed from dead letters. And if I press enter, they all get cleared. So now we have a keyboard that we can use for data entry. We've got a delete key, we've got an enter key, and we've got a grid, and we've got a random word. Now we can move on to the logic of the game. And I'm gonna start down here with an enumeration letter state. And this is gonna track the state of a letter, in particular, a letter in a cell. It starts off as blank, zero. The letter hasn't been guessed or evaluated. Now when I press a key, we're gonna have logic to change it to guess because the letter is being guessed. It hasn't been evaluated yet. Now, after it's evaluated, when I press enter, that code is going to set it to one of these three. It's either gonna be incorrect, the letter doesn't exist in the word, or letter, the letter exists, but it is in the wrong place, or place, which means you got it right. It exists and it's in the right place. Now I'm going to encapsulate all the code, uh, the state, and the code to evaluate a guess in a class, and I'm going to call it word row. So here's my word row class, and this represents the word in one row, okay? So we're going to need a list of word rows, and we're going to add them as we start guessing, but no more than six because you get six guesses. So I've got the word that's being guessed. I've got the state for each of the five letters. And I've got the letters themselves that are being guessed for the row. Here's my constructor. Pass in the word, the current word, right? Word row is a separate class, so it doesn't have access to current word. So we have to pass it in. And I'm initializing the uh, states in guessed letters arrays. So the next thing is guess. And this is a concatenation of all five guessed letters. And so that's going to return the word that the player has guessed. Now here's the meat of the logic, evaluate. Evaluate is going to tell us what the state of each letter is. Is this letter uh, incorrect? Is it the right letter in the right place? Is it the right letter in the wrong place? To do that, I've used this whole dead letters idea now I have my own dead letters here. If you remember, dead letters, the string exists in the app, not in word row. So I have my own string that I'm going to return at the end of this. And so when I call evaluate, it'll return all the dead letters for this guess, and I'm going to add those to the app's dead letters string. Follow me? So I start off with an empty string. Now this is a really cool thing. I've, I've got this string called left in word, and we're making the word uppercase because it's lowercase, as you know from the, from the dictionary. So this gets pruned as letters are guessed. We start off with the entire word, and whenever we've set the state of a letter, we want to take it out of left in word because we don't want to evaluate any letter twice. Let's say there's one E, and in the guess, there's two E's. Well, we want to hit the first one, and the second one we want to ignore because we've already evaluated E. So this is a really easy way to do that. Next, I'm going to find the exact matches in a loop. So we're looping through the columns, through the letters, and I've got my guessed letter from guess, and I've got my word letter from the word at that position. So let's say the word is brace, B-R-A-C-E. And I guess B-L-U-E-S, blues. So the guess letter is B and the word letter is B. So they need to evaluate to be exactly the same. So that's the first check I'm doing. Are they equal? Yes, this letter I guessed, B, is the same as the first letter in the word, B. So they're equal. So I'm going to set the state to place to indicate it's the right letter in the right position. And then I've got some code to remove the letter from the search word. Simple, old school string handling. Next, I have a loop to find fuzzy matches. 
So these are letters that might be the correct letter, but in the wrong place. So again, I'm going through the columns, and I'm looking at the guest letter and the word letter, same as before. Make sure they're not equal, because we've already evaluated the ones that are equal, right? And if the letter is there but in the wrong place, then left in word is going to contain that guest letter. So if that's true, I'm going to set the state to letter, indicating it's the right letter in the wrong position. Otherwise, the guest letter is not in the word. So I'm going to add it to the dead letters string, but only if the letter doesn't exist in the word. Just an extra check. And then I'm going to set the state to incorrect, indicating the letter is not in the word at all. Now, no matter what happens in this loop, I'm going to remove the letter from the search word because we've already evaluated it, and I'm going to return the dead letters. So that's evaluate and the word row class. Next, I need a list of word rows because I'm going to add a new word row every time we've started a new row to guess. So I have this variable now matrix, which is a list of word row. And I've also added these two, current row and current call. Now, these keep track of where I am as the user is guessing. So when a key is pressed, current row is going to be the row that they're guessing the word for. Current call is going to be the column that they're guessing the letter for. So as the player types letters, current call is going to increment. It's going to start at zero. They're going to press a letter, and now we'll go to 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, and then we're actually going to go to 5 after they press the last letter, and then we're going to increment current row. Unless we've already guessed 6 rows, and at that point, eh, the player loses. Follow me? So before we add any more logic here, let's update Index Razor with the complete version. All right, I've added a couple of things here. So in the cell, we need to change the background color based on its state, and we need to know what the letter is at that row and column. So therefore, I need these two methods, get letter color for row and column, and get letter for row and column. Let's add them now. All right, so get letter color looks at the state in the row of each letter, each column. And if it's blank or if it's guess, we're going to return white. If it's letter, meaning it's the right letter in the wrong position, we're going to return orange. If it's place, which means it's the right letter in the right position, we're going to return light blue. Otherwise, if it's incorrect, we're going to return gray. And white is the default. Now if we go down to get letter, we're making sure there is a word row at this row because we're adding them as we guess, right? When we start out, there's only one word row. If we're on the second row, there's two word rows, all right? So make sure the state is not blank. And if so, return the letter at the column. Looking back at index razor, get letter color and get letter no longer have squiggles. Let's move down here. Now I've added an error message, which is just a string that I set if there's something I want to show to the player. And yes, it could be an error. It could be, congratulations, you win. I called it error message anyway. I don't care. So uh, if it is not an empty string, we're going to put it in a span with a color red so it sticks out. Now play again is a Boolean that I'm setting to true if we're in the state where we want to allow the user to play again. So if that is true, I'm going to show the play again button calling reset game. Good thing we wrote that. Otherwise, we're guessing, right? So submit disabled is a read-only Boolean property that's going to return true if I haven't guessed the last letter in a row, all right? So this is a way we can easily disable the button. So let's add those fields, all right? There's error message and play again. Those are just fields. However, submit disabled, as I said, is a read-only Boolean property. Very simple. If the current column is less than 5, we're disabled. If the current column is 5, that means I've guessed the last column letter. 
So the submit button should be enabled. Now let's fix up key press. This was just for our demo. Let's change it to actually support the logic here. All right, and you see it's yelling at us because we also need this check to see if the word guest is actually in the dictionary. So let's add that. There we go. Is real word is going to check to see that the word is actually in all words. All right, I have the guess, which I get from the matrix row, guess. And if all words contains that guess, then it's real. All right, key press. Got my letter, clearing the error message. Now I've got my conditions, delete, enter. Let's go down to the last condition, which is a letter was pressed. I want to ensure that we have not guessed all of the letters in all of the rows. In other words, this is valid. And remember the guess letters property, it's a string array that contains the five letters in this guess. So we're essentially setting that letter in the current column to the letter that was entered. And then we're setting the state to guess, indicating that we're guessing it. And then we're going to increment to the next column. All right, that's if a letter was pressed. Now if delete or backspace was pressed, if the current row and column are in range for deleting, we're going to back up by setting current column to the one before it. We're going to clear the letter and set the state to blank. Hasn't been guessed yet. Next, enter. This is where the magic happens. All right, check that the row and column are valid. Get the word row at this row. Make sure it's a real word. If it's not a real word, we're going to show an error message. It's not a real word. More accurately, we don't know what this word is. Otherwise, we're going to call evaluate on that word row and append the return to dead letters. Now a little link to get the number of correctly positioned letters by looking at states, getting the number of states that match place. If we have them all correct, then the user wins. And we're going to set play again to true, and we're out of here. Finally, if we have room for a new row, we're incrementing current row and resetting the column to zero. And we're going to add a new word row with the current word. Still the same word, not a new game, but a new row. Otherwise, if this is the last row, sorry, but game over. Tell the player what the word is and set play again to true. All right, well, I've added a bunch of stuff here that I need to reset. And remember reset game? It was pretty simple. Let's fortify this a little bit. So now when we reset a game, we're going to initialize all our variables, including clearing the matrix, and get our random word. And we're going to create a new word row, passing in that current word, and we're going to add it to matrix. All right, now the very last thing that I want to do is change the color of the key to reflect the state. So let's look at key color. Dead letters, same test. If my letter is in dead letters, I'm going to return black. That means it's not there, right? But if it's not in dead letters, check this out. I've got the string last color. I really want to know the color, right? So I'm going through each word row in the matrix and I'm getting the index in the guess of that letter. And if it's in the guess, then I want to look at the state of that letter index. And if it's letter, I want to set the last color to brown. Now, because of the way the keyboard works, it's white text on a dark background, whereas the grid is black text on a colored background. So we're going to have to have more subdued colors. So rather than orange, we're going to use brown. And rather than light blue, we're going to use blue. So after I go through all of those, if the last color wasn't set, I'm going to return my regular gray. Otherwise, I'm going to return the last color. Now it's time to run this thing. All right, now let's test the logic. I'll do something like spear. OK, this is good. A is not there. It's blacked out here. S, P, and R are in the correct place, so they show up as blue on the keyboard as well. 
and E is in the wrong place. That should be here. So E is brown, and I know that's what brown looks like when combined with the other colors, but that's fine. So, so far, so good. All right, so let's make another guess. How about stern? Okay, S is still in the right place. He remembers that P is still in the right place from this guess. And E and R are not in the right place. And now T and N have been added to A in the dead letters. So this is good. Well, let's see what happens when we guess it correctly. S, P, I, E, R. There we go. You did it. Now the only thing I need to do is to remove this from the top and then we'll play together, okay? So I'm gonna comment this out and we'll try it again. I'm gonna give you my little strategy. I always start with Stern because I learned from Wheel of Fortune that the most common letters in any word in the English language are R, S, T, L, N, and E. So I can't guess all six, but I can guess five. Eh. I'm interested in the vowels first. So here's another word with letters I haven't used to test C, H, N, A, and L. All right, well, those are in the right place. So I'm gonna guess that N is here. So blank, H, A, N, blank. Let's see if phage is in there. P, H, A, G, E. Well, of course it isn't because E isn't there. But I got another letter, G. So it looks like blank H A N G. Let's pick a nonsense word. Who knows? Might not be nonsense. Really? Blank H A N G. The only thing I can think of is kind of a Chinese word. Z H A N G. And that's not a real word. B H A N G. All right. What is that word? Well, it's an edible mixture made from the buds, leaves, and flowers of the female cannabis or marijuana plant. Who knew? <laughs> well, I hope you learned something today, even if it is about marijuana. Now back to you in the studio, Carl. Do you like this kind of content? I sure had fun putting it together. It just gives your brain a little break, right? Well, if you do and you want to see more of this kind of stuff or you have any other suggestions, send them to me at carl at appvnext.com. I'll be happy to take your suggestions. Hey, thanks for riding the rails with me today. This is where I jump off. I'll see you next time. Blaze a train.